our final session will be a panel focused on social impact investing. Uh, I'll be led by executive professor and founder of the Social Enterprise Institute here at Northeastern, Professor Dennis Shaughnessy. Professor Shaughnessy is a longtime uh, impact investor himself, and today he'll be joined by Tim Spittle of Root Capital, Cynthia Hurd of New Profit, and Kati Sharp of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts Executive Office of Finance and Administration. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Professor Shaughnessy and the Social Impact Investing Panel. Thank you. So first, definitions, right? So imp social impact investing is a new field. Uh, there's a couple of big banks have um, issued reports on it. The latest, uh, highest number I've seen is about 1.2 trillion in assets globally. Uh, some of the other uh, banks that have written about it, JP Morgan and Credit Suisse are the two that focus their analysts on impact investing, say it's about a three to $400 billion market currently. Okay, so it's not a small thing. If pe people often say, well, it must be just a few uh, small funds that do this, it's not the case at all. So the structure of it is we have socially responsible investing that's old, right? It's been around for quite a while. That's a large sector within uh, financial investing today. Big names in that space are Calvert and their mutual funds, as well as the Domini investment funds here in Boston. So that socially responsible investing is the knock out the bad guys from your portfolio. So you take out arguably gambling companies, uh, maybe defense companies, depending on your view. So SRI pushes out the bad guys. The SRI returns on their funds typically are equal to and often marginally exceed returns on traditional uh, investment portfolios. So they've done well in that space of SRI. The next space up is concessionary impact investing, and that is organizations that invest for return, but make a concession on the, on the amount of return in exchange for social impact. The major uh, sector within concessionary social impact investing is in providing capital to microfinance firms. The microfinance global market is $300 billion potential market, about 40 billion service today. So also a large, I'm sure you've all heard microfinance before, right? So that's small, uncollateralized, income-generating loans to poor women in the developing world. So a, a market that has had high performance um, across both the private and public sectors. And then we have a whole bunch of new evolving impact investing um, institutions as well as funds that cover the gamut from venture capital funds that do preferred stock rounds but only in impact organizations. We see a lot of investors in that space looking at the new B corporations for opportunities to invest. The big, uh, the big future hit in that space is Warby Parker. Have you heard of them doing the glasses? So Warby Parker is, is heading down an IPO path as a B corp, which means that they are doing stakeholder rather than shareholder primacy theory of investing for their investors. So it'll be an interesting challenge to see if that makes it through the IPO process probably in the second half of this year. And there are a whole bunch of other uh, uh, types of impact investors uh, and impact investing funds as well. So that's the broad overview. Now to our alums who are working in the space. I'm gonna hand the mic, or Tim, you have your own microphone, right? I'm going to hand it to Tim Spittle first to talk about his organization, which is a Cambridge, Massachusetts firm called Root Capital, what they do, and what he does at Root Capital. Sure. Is this, uh, uh, yep. So Root Capital is a um, nonprofit social investment fund. So within the construct that Professor Sean just laid out of the impact investing space from sort of an enabling perspective of who are the bigger impact investors that invest in us, specifically usually concessionary um, impact investors in the contract you just laid out. So we're more of a practitioner. We consider ourselves a social investment company, but investment is just really a tool we use within poverty alleviation. So we aim to help grow rural prosperity in particular. So there are roughly 7 billion people on this planet. 2.8 billion of them live on less than $2 a day. Of those, 75% are rural. And the vast majority of them make their, they're more or less marginalized from the formal economic sectors of the cities within 
most developing nations, and so they rely almost exclusively on agriculture. So we focus specifically on providing not only lending capital, but financial advisory services and help uh, strengthening market connections, sort of catalyzing a market by working also with buyers within some of the agricultural value chains to do everything we can to strengthen the ability for rurally poor, agriculturally dependent people to go from subsistence, subsistence level farming, where they're just making enough to provide food for their family and, and a slight income, to actually taking advantage of value chains and growing and businesses, small and growing businesses that will help them out of poverty. Um, so from our perspective, we use lending, we lend capital as a, as a means to sort of achieve that goal. And so we consider ourselves a, a more direct impact, uh, impact investor, I guess you could say, within the scope of if you're looking at impact investing as a whole. Um, so my job in particular is as a lending analyst. Um, that re revolves mostly around performance analytics, uh, business intelligence systems, and and creating the systems that can help us report, project, uh, analyze our performance, and, and sort of figure out what we're doing right, what we can do better from a, an operations standpoint specifically. So my background here was in uh, as a finance major, but also studying social entrepreneurship um, with Professor Shaughnessy. And so I've got to roll both of those up really neatly into uh, working at Root Capital. Perfect. Thanks. Cynthia. Hi. Hi, I'm Cynthia. Um, I work for New Profit. It's a venture philanthropy fund here in Boston. Um, so essentially, we're focused on um, taking philanthropic money and investing it in nonprofits that we think um, have proven impact and are scalable. So a few examples of that are Teach for America, KIPP, and Europe. Um, so we're generally focused on social mobility here in the US. So education, poverty alleviation, workforce development, and public health. Um, so we do that in a numerous in various ways. So one is the um, giving of money, but we also provide a lot of support. Usually one of our partners will sit on the board of the organization that we're giving to and um, help them grow, help them develop the proper strategy and tools um, to, to create effective scale. Um, we also um, link all of these social entrepreneurs together. And so we're focusing on building domains that that allow people to kind of connect and see what's going on and work together to, to create greater change. Um, we also have a policy segment, um, so we're focused on um, changing policy for the better. And um, <coughs> excuse me. And so we, it's, it's kind of a an all all around approach to hopefully create systemic change. Right now, focused in the U.S. And I'm the I'm a finance associate, so. I have my CPA, um, I did taxes for hedge funds for a while and switched over here and now I help with budgeting, reporting, and general day-to-day -day financial administration. Why did you make the switch, Cynthia, from your first job to your second? Well, after um, I was an accounting major here at Northeastern and um, took a lovely trip to South Africa with Professor Shaughnessy and then studied social entrepreneurship after that. Um, I had accepted my offer um, for a public accounting firm before that trip, um, so followed through with it, got my CPA, but um, knew that I was gonna end up with um, doing something that had a, a more substantive um, meaning to me, I guess. Great, well said. Katya, you're up. Um, hi, I'm Katya. Um, so I work actually in government, um, which I'm sure you're surprised to hear. Um, so I work for essentially the governor's budget office. Um, so um, the unit that I work for is actually um, for long-term economic analysis and for special finance projects. Um, and we're working on a couple of um, what we call innovative financing projects. Um, one in particular is a social impact bond, um, which um, is essentially a method by which um, we can partner with the private sector to finance um, services that we think can save government money in the, long, in the medium to long term, um, but that we don't have money for in our budget um, on an annual basis. Um, so I also work on um, kind of the reform process. And in general, um, what we've seen is that, you know, especially in the wake of the recession, um, government finances have not bounced back yet. Um, 
people will come to my office um, with these great ideas where um, they can say, you know, we can guarantee you you'll save $10 million over 10 years if you invest $5 million now. Um, we don't have $5 million to invest um, because, you know, all of our money goes to um, kind of the safety net at this point. Um, so this is a way to fund services up front um, by um, taking loans and um, philanthropic grants um, and saying we will repay um, in the event that some specific outcomes are met um, in the end. Um, I actually um, first heard about social impact bonds in one of Professor Shaughnessy's classes um, and took my last co-op at um, the budget office um, and got to start working on these social impact bonds and the reform process in general. Um, and that's why I'm there. Thank you. So I think everybody in the audience, given a quick look around, you all understand the methods and measures of financial return, right? And that analyzing financial return. So you know about revenue growth, margins, return on investment, PE multiples, all those things that generate investment, uh, We'll keep investment analysts busy. Um, so the question in the social impact space is, well, are there equivalent measures like PEs, like returns, on impact? How would you measure whether or not an investor who's, let's say, either a strategic venture philanthropist who's expecting no return, or a concessionary investor expecting a moderate return, how would they know whether they made the right decision among the many choices in the social sector to put their capital to work. That is, how do you measure social impact? So I'm gonna ask the three of you, either through the, the, your organization's eyes or through your own eyes, much more broadly, what are your thoughts about how social impact can be measured and calculated commensurate with financial impact and financial return? was not on the list of pre-approved questions. <laughs> um, so I guess with all due disclosure, I don't work in the impact department. We have a very sophisticated impact department, probably one of the most cutting edge within our specific space of sort of outlining what are the impact metrics you can really um, quantify in the, in the way you're speaking specifically to, for a specific investment for that initiative, what are the direct impacts that come from that. I always like to think about impact as sort of the end of a continuum of action. So you start with the input, what do we do? We give loans to small and growing agricultural businesses in hopes that they can grow and build the livelihoods of all their farmers. So that's our input. Our output is they get money. They have working capital. They have capital asset um, financing to, to buy a plant. They have that specific need filled with the output. What is the outcome? This is what we can really actually say, is the outcome is we reached, you know, 100 farmers who had four people for, per family, that's um, 400 <laughs> people that were, directed by, that were directly impacted by our dollars. And we can say that, yes, their revenue from this year went from a uh, million dollars to two million dollars. So we know that we've directly impacted them with our financing, helping to build their businesses, to build their livelihoods. That is all quantifiable, but the impact and, and people might fight me on this, is sort of the last leg of that race, right? We can get to the point where we say, yep, your business is better, you've got more money, that's an output, excuse me, an outcome in sort of the nomenclature that I've right. seen in the space. The impact is, well, what did that outcome actually do in ending the cycle of poverty? Because you can increase someone's, um, you know, their household income next year, no problem, there's some way we can do that. We can give them all of our specific attention to do that next year, wipe our hands clean, go home, and, and say we did a good job. But what's the impact? Did you actually help someone out of poverty? So when people talk about impacts and metrics, I feel like they never really go deep enough, and that's where the struggle is right now, because the rigor that's required to actually get and prove something like that, in reality, right, for, uh, for our example, we would need to do randomized controlled studies for every country, community, for all the farmers in that specific space and say, yep, the ones we lent to, they got out of poverty. All the other ones stayed in poverty. We're perfect. We, we're done. But that's not feasible. So for us, it's really <laughs> trying to balance out what types of metrics are, are quantifiable, are easily, um, we can easily get through surveys or some type of, sometimes we do just specific studies on, on clients 
anecdotal studies, if you will, to prove we did have impact in this one space, but we can't really prove that across all of our operations. We work in almost 40 countries now. It's, it's not plausible. So I would answer your question saying that I don't think we have the answer to that yet, but there are people like Root Capital who are continuously trying to sort of define the conversation within impact to say, set your standards properly for the impact investors to know what we can prove, to know what kind of output outcome we can have that we can quantify and we can tell you that your dollar had that impact, but not necessarily to say all the way down the line that perfect golden answer of, of uh, long-term impact. Good, you pass, Tim. Yes. <laughs> Cynthia, do you have any thoughts on it? I agree a lot with Tim in that um, it's, it, at least for our organization, it's easy to, to measure the, the additional locations of the organizations we work with and the additional lives touched, the additional students, the additional jobs received. Um, those are all, that's all data that we collect on a regular basis to try to, to give out to our donors as an example of, of why we're doing well. But I think it, for us especially, we're so focused on systemic change that it's, it's a long, it's a, it takes a long time to measure that. So uh, my organization's 15 years old now, so they've been collecting that data for 15 years, but um, there's still a long way to go in, in seeing that broad change. But um, I think even with some of our earlier organizations, Teach for America and KIPP um, specifically, and Europe as well, um, the, the impact is, is there, and um, they've, those have become household names almost, which I think is, is pretty remarkable, and hopefully that continues to be the case, and as more people, as these things are more household names, more interest is around it, and the time and um, uh, resources will be available to continue to study that impact. Katya, any thoughts? So, um, I think one of the lucky things, and also one of the biggest limiting factors of social impact bonds is that um, you can really only design a bond around something that has measurable savings to government. And those measurable savings usually reflect some kind of um, better social outcome um, because savings are less use of the safety net. Um, for our first project, um, we're actually repaying investors based on um, the number of bed days that we're reducing um, young men going back to jail um, based on the services that are provided by the service provider who reaches out to kids who either um, came out of juvenile incarceration or are on probation um, and keeps them from going back to prison. Um, that's a really measurable result and it, um, we think at least it, um, it is um, something that points to um, a better social outcome. Um, we're also paying on um, increase in employment. So we're measuring um, the, the amount of wages that um, these people are making um, after we give them services and um, comparing that to a control group through a randomized control trial. Um, so, so we do have a very rigorous evaluation set up, um, you know, and RCT is the gold standard in evaluation. Um, I think that more broadly, um, we picked a project that is very easy to measure outcomes, um, specifically for our first social impact bond. Um, there are lots of things that we would love to um, build social impact bonds around that um, it's much harder to quantify um, the social outcomes that you're achieving as well as the savings to the state. And the first major social impact bond in the US was a Goldman Sachs project, right? Do you, yeah. Are you able to explain that or is it a little, they're complicated instruments, so almost yeah. like derivatives. <laughs> Yeah, so, um, I mean, the basic theory, I mean, social, social impact bond is kind of a misnomer. It's not actually a bond. Um, they've been done in different ways. There are four social impact bonds right now, um, with many more on the way. Um, essentially, the government will say, we think we can produce savings to the state within some medium-term five-year, seven-year goal. Um, we borrow money. Um, for our social impact bond, we're borrowing money from Goldman Sachs as a senior lender. Um, they get repaid first if we show success. Um, we have a couple of junior, junior lenders who will get repaid second. Um, and then there are some grant money that um, if we have really high levels of success, like 60% reduction in the amount of days that people go back to jail, um, we actually repay the grants, and then um, the grants will get recycled into some other um, social impact bond or expansion of the services of this service provider. Um, Goldman Sachs actually has invested in um, the three first United States social impact bonds. 
Um, and they're not all designed the same way that ours is. Um, actually, in New York City, um, they're also doing a recidivism project. Um, but that project has a backstop. So um, Goldman Sachs um, invests their money, and 75% um, of it is um, not on the line, and only 25% of it is. This other philanthropy um, will put up money in the event that Goldman loses their money. So they can be structured. Evelyn Bloomberg, Michael Bloomberg's uh, philanthropic fund. OK, good. Uh, Tim, back to you. Um, who are some of the investors in Root Capital? So do you have a sense of what kind of people want to provide capital to you? Root Capital, by the way, guys, has a $500 million uh, loan portfolio outstanding. So it's not a, it's not a tiny organization. F no, it's not five, $500 million? Yeah. The total value of all loans. Mm -hmm. Your CEO gave a report to investors like me. <laughs> oh, no, that was 500 million cumulative disbursements. Our loan portfolio Explain outstanding rate. So we disperse money, we get repaid money. Whatever's outstanding at a point in time is our portfolio outstanding. Currently, is it about 85 million the last time I checked? Um, but cumulative disbursements from when we've, we've really seen some significant growth have been $500 million out the door that we've, most of it has come Good back. correction. So what kind of investors do you, uh, that are, are interested in providing capital to your firm? Mm -hmm. So uh, there's two people in the audience that used to work in our investor relations, so they're probably better at answering this and can correct me if I'm not wrong, but our biggest current, I believe our biggest current investment is from the OPIC, the Overseas Private Investment Corporation. It's a private investment um, arm of the U.S. government, sort of our foreign aid that's more calculated, directed, gets returns. Um, the International Finance no, what is it? The International Fid IFC, International Fiduciary Corp, Finance. Finance. Corp. Anyways, so, um, and then Gates actually is one of our, our bigger currently investing. And so these investments typically range from anywhere. That would be Bill Gates. Bill Gates, yes, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Sorry, he, I should be. He more has specific. a he has some money to invest. Decent amount of money. Um, so we actually take two different types of investments. This is why you know when we say we're a nonprofit investment fund, people sort of. Depending on who you're speaking with, you almost leave the nonprofit off the beginning of it because you say that, and, and typically actually it would be people dressed like you. And it's a, you say, oh, nonprofit, and they just turn off. They're like, I, I don't want to hear it. You're a nonprofit, like, don't care. But we are, we act as if we are a for profit. The nonprofit is really that, as we are currently structured, we don't cover all of our costs. So break even economics, if that's interesting to you, and trying to, that's sort of part of my job narrow your operations to break even. That's where we are currently. That's not to say that we're bad at what we do. It's just you're working in a, in a new market, in a market no one's ever proven before, an unmet need that no one else exactly does what we do. So we get private investments. So Gates gives us not only a debt instrument, sometimes you know a line of credit that we can draw down when we need working capital, which can be anywhere from some of our investments are up to $10 million. But they also give us philanthropy. So at the end of the year, we say, yep, we covered 80% of our costs. We need to fill the rest with philanthropy, typically for OPEX. Um, and there are c certain portions of our business that are constantly um, receiving subsidies like this, uh, more around our training, our market catalyzation. Those things, we don't want to cover uh, the costs with our um, lending operations because there are people always willing to um, donate to things like that. So. There are big people in both spaces. Uh, obviously, the biggest investment is coming from the, the debt side, where we're actually raising our own debt to then forward and lend on. Um, but those are the three biggest that, off the top of my head, but okay. lots of individual donors as well with big pockets. Cynthia, do you know who provides capital to New Profit? Uh, yeah, the, um, the primary um, source of income is from high net worth individuals and family foundations. Um, we also do have a, a federal grant for a um, specific set of our portfolio um, that uh, it's called the Social Social Innovation Fund, um, and so that that's a large portion of our of our income. Great. And Katya, it feels like this isn't the right question for you, <laughs> being a government employee. Yeah. So in the audience, do you guys, if you think forward about what future in, um, investing could be like for people like you, have you heard of the Giving Pledge? You know what that is, right? So that's uh, billionaires who signed up, signed and committed to donating at least half of their net worth, mostly before they die. But that accumulated amount today through the first 40 or 50 people is about $175 billion awaiting investment if it's socially driven or venture philanthropy. That total amount over time 
most people think it's going to come out to about a half trillion when, when we're all done. So you start with Bill Gates, of course, and then Zuckerberg's on there, plus Zuckerberg's roommates are on there. And, and um, you know that, yeah, they, they were like five, six billion each, some of them. So, and you have Larry Ellison from Oracle and a whole variety of people. Although, interestingly enough, the most famous billionaire who, who specifically said no was Steve Jobs. Actually, the only one that Gates asked face to face who said no. But Warren Buffett is on there as well. So those people are looking for a combination of strategic venture philanthropy guidance as well as social impact investing. So the f there's a lot of future opportunity in the space as this all shakes out over the coming years as people sort out where the money's going to go from this early 21st century boom and, and uh, high net worth people coming out of the technology sector in particular. Okay, so we can wrap up with asking each of you, starting with Katya, would you recommend to s students um, consideration of either a co-op or an internship or even examining full-time postgraduate employment opportunities in the impact investing space? Um, yeah, that's kind of a loaded question. Um, yes, I would. Um, I think, you know, I was an international affairs major. Um, Coming from a liberal arts degree, um, you know you're probably not going to be making um, the most when you graduate. Um, I think entering the impact investing space is a way to um, to be able to say that you are doing something positive and um, achieve, you know, your personal goals um, while also making a living wage. Yes, as well. Um, Coming from public accounting and having many friends in um, financial positions now, I would say that nobody is as happy as <laughs> the people that I work with. Um, it's it's just a motivating, inspirational place to be, to push you forward, and no amount of money makes up for that. Also, that being said, um, where I am now, it's not low paying, so... <laughs> I'm not on welfare, so that's, that's pretty good. That's very encouraging to hear. <laughs> <clears throat> Tim? Um, yeah, and I would say so. I mean, both of what both of you said is, is perfectly right. But for me, what I like about working in this space is that from a finance perspective, you're doing something no one's ever done before, right? You're not just, we're not just, yes, we're giving loans. Everyone's given loans before. I'm not saying that's revolutionary. Right, but exactly like I mentioned before, this break-even economics of how do you build portfolio structures to manage to your subsidy and get new products to clients who've never received financing before and sort of build this new market that then other people are going to want to come in and actually serve. So the decisions we're making every day from a finance point of view is sort of, you know, we're always trying to drive that forward, but every once in a while, like recently, we've had some pretty high-level discussions, and we're a pretty small finance team about completely restructuring the portfolio. What would it look like? How would we drive um, forward growth? How do we manage our subsidy? Where does our interest rate come from? How do we lean OPEX? Like, those are decisions where, you know, no one's ever really done this. There's no blueprint. We're not just following along on the manual, right? We're sort of making new decisions and doing something new. But even a step further, as far as B Corps, like Professor mentioned, um, social impact bonds, there's, there's this growing sort of need for more than just philanthropy or debt or normal financing tools. So that people are sort of creating new tools and specifically financial, um, you know, investment, what, what is the word I'm looking for? Packages that have never really been seen, instruments, that's what I was looking for, that have never really been seen before. And so uh, this is like at the cutting edge of this and being able to do finance, more or less, right? But in this sort of new space that's never been met, like that's interesting to me. Good. Good. So, you've been here all day. I'm looking at your faces. You look like you're ready to go. Um, do you have any questions you'd like to ask our group? Very good. Thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, under the broader idea of impact investment and the role of that in like solving the problem as opposed to like government policies solving the problem, it's just what you think of like the effectiveness of that. I'm specifically thinking in terms of like climate change, where it seems like government policies and international agreement um, really isn't going to materialize, as opposed to like clean tech investing. Hmm. So, what do you see like the role of that? 
Great question. You guys want to try it? So we are, it's funny you brought up climate change and sort of the effects of that. So we're not necessarily at any forefront of clean tech or trying to drive changes that would um, necessarily bring down the effects or the, the growth of climate change, right? But we are definitely at the forefront of dealing with the sort of um, outcomes of that, to use the words I used before, right? So our farmers, sometimes we, we're seeing that with rising... Um, Rising temperatures, so coffee's grown on mountains, for example. So if you planted your coffee on a mountain and all of a sudden the temperature starts to rise, the band where you can actually grow your coffee starts to move up the mountain, whether your farm's with it or not, right? So people are starting to lose their, their coffee farms. So we've created new investment portfolios that we raise money for called the Coffee Farmer Resiliency Initiative, where we help them not only keep that farm space and plant something new that can now grow at this new climate, but move their coffee plants upstream, or sorry, up the mountain, right? So that is a, we saw a need, we met it, it's, we have an impact directly from it, but it's still just giving them a loan, a specific loan that fits a need they, that they have. Um, so for us, there, I understand your sort of question was more around how do we create that sort of bigger systemic change. Of course, government has more power to create that change in, in whatever you know, specific, so if we're talking about a Nicaragua co coffee farmer, if they had the, the power to you know, slow down climate change global-wide, like, yes. Getting the root cause of the issue is something that maybe not all, uh, specifically our social enterprise could do, our type of impact investing, but we can sort of address the people most affected by some of those more systemic issues where there is an unmet need, where the government isn't doing something, um, and help them in that way. Very good. You know, one of the things that people, I think, often misunderstand about impact investing in this space, I've been around it for some time, is that it usually attracts very conservative people. So it's not social, liberal, progressive people that necessarily dominate this. Many of us think that the power of it is to eliminate the need for aid and government uh, funding of a lot of programs. In fact, if we can get private capital to enable the poor to be self-reliant, then that's a very conservative view of the power of business and capitalism to change the world for the better. And that's really what a lot of folks in this space are thinking about is, uh, reducing the dependence on taxation to fund government programs and instead let individual investors make choices about how to do it ourselves and dedicate our capital to solving those problems. There was another question. I saw it somewhere. Yes, sir. Uh, hoping you can maybe speak to the issue like scaling out social impact investing while still focusing on like, the social aspect of those returns and not letting that like, value be diluted by like, no reference. Tell me what you mean by scaling out. So increasing a loan portfolio, reaching more people, um, maybe replacing government services in your case, um, making a broader... Great. Do you have any thoughts? Team? Yeah, so um, I think in our case, you know, you're never going to replace the whole safety net with um, impact investing, but... Um, there are, I mean, I think, I think there are a lot of people that think that um, you can spend less money on preventive services um, and achieve and, you know, touch more lives than um, you can, you know, funding Medicaid and, you know, funding prisons and all that. So um, I think we're definitely looking at this in order to um, find a way to touch more lives with the same taxpayer dollars. Go ahead. Um, so I'm glad you asked that because, so little caveat, I took eight credited courses with Professor Shaughnessy, so I know he's going to love this answer. He's like, once you have a professor long enough, you just like know what he wants in the answer. Um, so for us, right, there is, it's a little trickier for us to grow because driving the demand side, finding more clients is a little trickier because we, we, there's fewer and far between like coffee cooperatives socially you know, organic, fair trade certified, that sort of niche that we work in. But from an example of like microfinance, which is a really, was much hotter, is like, is now sort of the, 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 the social impact investment that we, put, that we put on a pedestal. Everyone's like, look, we've done this. We've given small loans to um, poor women and it's paid off and we've made money. Specifically, 
when you talk about scale. So for us, we're doing it at a very sort of deliberate pace. We're finding new clients, we're growing, we're trying to understand what scale we need to reach to cover all of our costs, what our cost of capital needs to be and our interest rates. Like that's all just very calculated. We're working towards it and we're very sure we will reach that point when we start to be sustainable and make profit. From a microfinance standpoint, there's an example case that Professor Shaughnessy, I know he's gonna know what I'm talking about. It's called Banco Comportamos. It was this bank and uh, microfinance institution in Mexico. And they said, how can we most scale? Because there's demand for microfinance. You say, hey, I'm giving small loans to poor women in a city, and poor women will come, they will beat a path to your door, right? Because they, want, they need a loan. They want to start their own business. They want to help themselves out of poverty. That is a need, especially in an urban setting. So that's why it's a little different for us, right? Where you have a, a critical mass of people that need that service. So they said, how can we get enough money to lend to all these people? Well, we'll take on equity investments. So they took on equity investments. And then sooner or later, they actually went public. They were the first microfinance institution to go public. And they paid a 53% return to their investors. They had a $1.8 billion um, market valuation at the time of the IPO. So they raised $500 million by selling mm -hmm. a little bit more than a third. So people said, well, wait a second. You m made a lot of money um, off of poor women paying you back. And those poor women in times were taking interest rates, effective interest rates of over 100%. Was it now that you had so much cost, you had, you're now, your loyalty lies with your stakeholders. Sorry, not your, you know, your investors rather than your beneficiaries. So there is a fine line to be walked there about, and so we've had to toy with that as well, because we could hypothetically spin out a for-profit sort of subsidiary, which could take equity investments. This is all stuff that's been on the table for root capital for us. Um, how do you balance the, the need of the mission and the, vulnerability, more or less, of the beneficiaries that you're actually, the people you're trying to help. Because you could very easily, you know, we could charge much higher rates and some people don't have choices. You know, we're the only lender that will lend to them. They're too big for microfinance, they're too small for conventional banks. So there is, you know, mission needs to be the driver, which is sort of why, um, for us, nonprofit made sense because we can keep that in check that within this specific organizational structure. But, yeah, that's a, a good question, specifically from an impact investing standpoint of how much do you let you know, scale and money drive versus keeping the, the mission in mind and keeping the, the beneficiaries in mind. Good, good answer, Tim. You're right, I was expecting that answer and you delivered it good for you. Any other questions? Mike. Uh, you guys talked a little bit about where your jobs have taken you in terms of all over the world. Or what about that? Jobs and undergraduate study at Northeastern? Katia, where did you go while you were here? Yeah, so, I mean, my job has not taken me anywhere because I work for the state. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> but um, as an undergrad, I actually um, traveled a lot. Um, I went to, on the um, senior um, capstone um, program, just like you did, um, my trip went to Nicaragua and Costa Rica, um, where we studied um, rural farming and um, uh, trade, um, so, and fair trade. Um, I also went to the Dominican Republic in Cuba, um, where we studied um, primarily microfinance. Um, yeah. Cynthia? Um, I unfortunately did not um, discover all of these lovely programs until the very end of my time at Northeastern. Um, so South Africa was the only trip I got to go on. Um, and now I work for a nonprofit that's focused domestically, so we're pretty much, pretty much in the U.S. here. Tim? <laughs> I went on the South Africa trip, the Dominican trip. I did a four-month co-op in the Dominican. I worked with Root Capital, my now job, in Peru for four months. I've also traveled to Senegal and Kenya to work in our offices there for brief periods, and we'll be going to Mexico and Costa Rica this year. Awesome. Nice. Alex. Can I try that one, guys? So I think, it's, I think you're going to see two different sectors. The first is going to be mainstream investing institutions that have their own uh, groups, working groups within. So Goldman Sachs already has an impact investing group. They have a 10,000 women program, but they also have a, a concentrated group with partners in impact investing, as do many of the larger investment banks as well. And Bank of America has a large organization as well 
for domestic activity and community reinvestment and affordable housing. So there's a number of different um, traditional institutions that are doing it, and I think it's going to grow as a percentage of their overall investing activity. And then second, I think you, you probably know that we do about 300, I think this is a number that appears in things like the Wall Street Journal and the Financial Times all the time. The U.S. does $300 billion a year in um, donations to nonprofits, $300 billion. Maybe it's closer to 350 currently after the shakeup. Uh, I think some of it is coming back. So that money, the, a rich person, although of course that's not all rich people, but high net worth people provide that money and they get no money back. And that's one way to manage your, your total net worth. A third way against traditional investing and give money and get nothing back is to invest and get something back. Not a traditional return, but not zero. And that space, which I'm calling the new third way of social impact investing, that space will grow. And you know, we hope that it won't be a pull from the 350, reducing the donation power. But some of it will, I think, migrate from traditional donations into impact investing. But I think most of it will come from traditional investors saying, uh, I made $40 million because I was in early as an engineer at Google. And I would like to take a million dollars from what I made or $2 million from my stock options. And instead of just donating it to charity, I want to start a portfolio of impact investing and have different types of investments there that I can watch grow and understand the impact of what I'm doing. And we're seeing that already, that, that your generation of tech entrepreneurs who've had big financial windfalls are looking to establish impact investing portfolios. Bill Gates is the leader in this space. He has his own impact investing fund, among many others. And Zuckerberg has an impact investing fund being put together now. And I think we'll see more and more of that. And that will present opportunities for people like you to invest that money wisely. I think it will be a terrific opportunity to understand that social impact can be measured because these, kind, these are the type of people that want quantitative outcomes. We'll be able to measure social impact and tell Zuckerberg, here's what you got for your money, specifically what you did and why it puts you in the top 10% band of impact investing performance. All that lies ahead and not 20 years from now, but two, three, or five years from now, I think you're gonna see that happening in the investing space. Are there any other remaining questions? Yes. My question would be the three of you, you're probably not from Central Fund. Where do you see yourself in five to ten years? Uh, still in the same industry, somewhere in the difference? Great question. Good one to wrap up with too. So thank you for that. And guys, what do you think? Um, I I would like to travel abroad, probably do something like one acre fund for a little bit um, within the next five to ten years. Um, but Generally, I just see myself um, progressing in the in the kind of trajectory that is I see for myself right now. And um, I just started less than a year ago, so there's definitely a lot of room for growth for me in my current position. But also, I'm exposed to so many organizations, and um, so we'll see. <laughs> but continuing in the same space for sure. Um, so I will likely not. Be in government forever. Um, I will likely um, transition to um, probably probably either a nonprofit or a for-profit um, impact investment type of firm. Um, I'm actually very interested in um, outcomes measurement, and um, there are some firms and um, some more academically focused um, firms like at MIT that um, that do this specifically. That you know travel around the world and um, investigate the impact of different um, interventions. Uh, definitely going to be staying at my job for a little bit longer. Like I said, we're at a pretty interesting point where we're trying to reach that break even, and this is a sort of like finance person's dream of, to be here during this time. In the long term, sort of, I always, I have a sense, so exactly like sort of what Professor Charnasi laid out of like, there is this new growing space somewhere in the middle of that impact investing, which is new and ever evolving. So sort of moving more to the money side, more to the impact investing side in that space seems like something I would be very interested in, but again, it's like, it's so, it's, evolving a lot. And I think getting where I am now in the practitioner side and getting to a place where once we do break, break even, because obviously we're going to, we get to that point and say, hey, I, I worked in a social enterprise that proved you could 
have a social impact, make a profit, and then sort of take that knowledge and, and move to sort of try and catalyze more people like that, because there will probably be more excitement around that idea, sort of ride that wave. Great answers. Two things left. One, thank you very much for coming. I'm proud of all of you. I couldn't be proud of NU alums. And secondly, if you're not graduating, how many of you are not graduating this term? We have an impact investing class that counts as a finance elective. And this year, this fall, it will be taught by an, uh, an adjunct who started his own impact investing venture fund uh, here in Boston that has co-ops and Northeastern alums working there called Invested Development. So you're going to get a real practitioner's sense. He has offices in Boston and Kenya. And he'll be teaching that, and I think it would be a great course for you to consider. One of the things that we do in that course is we give you real money. So we, it tends to be around 25000 U.S. that you invest uh, as part of the class. We've invested a couple hundred thousand dollars over the course of our impact investing programs so far in a number of different organizations around the world. And I think it's especially fun to take a class like that, as Mike can attest to, where you're investing in uh, organizations that you do direct due diligence on, build some sort of social and financial valuation models. It'll be a great class in the fall. So thanks for your attention at the end of the day. We appreciate it. Thanks.